things that I found in a community urology practice is I'd have people coming for, for either first opinions or second opinions, and a third of them said, I absolutely don't want to have surgery. A third of them say, I definitely want it out. And the other third of those patients that are in between that you spend a lot of time with. Patient comes to you and says, I want to have surgery. What yeah. do you do? Well, this surgeon, that, that's the patient's choice. It's not my job to talk anybody into a treatment. Right. What my job is, is to very carefully mm -hmm. outline the pros and cons so that when patients make a decision, they've made it with appropriate informed consent. Because the gut reaction is always, if you have something, cut it off. Well. They don't do that for breast cancer. They don't do that for head and neck cancer. Most malignancies have moved to less invasive procedures. And what it's important for patients to understand that brachytherapy removes the prostate just like a prostatectomy does. It is a bladed procedure. It destroys the entirety of the gland. So instead of removing it with a knife, we're removing it with uh, the seeds. And we, we know that because the PSAs eventually fold to zero or just about zero, just as they do with surgical removal, and using some, some very high-tech imaging studies, within four, six, eight months of the procedure, there's no viable prostate tissues left within the gland. Could you define PSA? Prostate-specific antigen. Yeah, and what is it exactly? It is a blood test um, that is a, a substance produced by the prostate gland, produced only by prostate tissue, that circulates through the bloodstream, and it is a marker for activity within the prostate. It is not pathognomonic of the diagnosis of prostate cancer, and it can be elevated for multiple reasons. Such as? Such as benign prostatic hyperplasia, benign enlargement, prostatitis, inflammation, infection, trauma. So we look at a whole host of activities. We know the higher the PSA, the greater the chances are that you have prostate cancer. PSA velocities change from one measurement to the other over a three, six month or a year. You're exactly a right. Year. I tell patient groups at 45, they should have a PSA. And what I tell them, if you don't have a family history, I'd get a PSA at 45, and if it's under one, I think you can wait till you're 50. And if it's one or higher, I think you should start yearly. Well, my PSA is 0 0.8. Is it? Wow, yeah. you're in great shape. So it's rare that you would turn somebody down for brachytherapy. I wouldn't say rare, because I think it's important to, to carefully select patients. Not all patients are optimally tr treated right. with any one procedure. But the vast majority of men who are interested in brachytherapy are good candidates. And I think the best candidates are young men. You know, we have published, along with others, long-term data on young men. Uh, this puts them back in the workplace the following day with the lowest risk of urinary incontinence and the best potency preservation rates. So a very high percentage of our patients are very, very young. Do you think there's clinically insignificant prostate cancer? Do I think that there's clinically insignificant prostate cancer in a 50-year-old? Probably not. But, you know, a lot of the guys that we're looking at for active surveillance have very low-volume disease. They're 65 to 75 years old. And in about a third of those men, I find a single focus of Gleason 6 or two focus of Gleason 6, low volume, uh, no perineural invasion, and we're watching those guys. I do a lot of watchful waiting. You know, I'm a brachytherapist, but, you know, I, I will probably do 220 cases of brachy this year, about 120, 140 cases of external beam, 150 maybe. We'll probably do 20 cases a year of watchful waiting. So, you know, I, just because you see me does not mean you're going to get brachytherapy. Yeah. And we don't do a lot of old guys. You know, right now, 40% of my brachy population is under the age of 60. You know, watchful waiting is not a benign, not a benign watchful waiting. Is biopsies how often? Well, after I've done a mapping on these guys, I'm not doing any more biopsies on these guys. I've mapped them. I've gone through their gland. I'm watching their PSA velocity. We do not do active surveillance unless we've done a complete mapping biopsy where we have gone through the gland and we're confident that out of 60, 65, 70 biopsies, there's no disease. How often do you do mapping versus accepting yeah. the biopsy of the urologist? Well, we do mapping in three ways. We, we begin the mapping program by doing guys that had multiple negative office biopsies. Okay. And in those guys, I've diagnosed prostate cancer in 52% of the cases. We then get to the point where some guys, you know, start to read and say, I want this up front. 
And as an upfront biopsy procedure, we've diagnosed prostate cancer scaringly in 80% of men. And then the third way I've used it is the men that have been referred to me with clinically insignificant prostate cancer that we think would be a good candidate for watchful waiting. And we've done the mapping to determine that. So you don't jump to hormone therapy? No, I think that we need to be very, very cautious with hormonal therapy. I think it's something that's been used way too much. I think we're beginning to learn much more about appropriate patient selection, especially looking at PSA velocity and doubling times to determine when those men should start hormonal therapy. Do you ever use hormonal therapy before you do this procedure? Yes, we do. You know, for a very large gland, we would downsize that gland to shrink it to make it more amendable to brachytherapy. Uh, number two, for certain types of high-risk patients with very high PSAs, high Gleason scores, we very often will use a combined modality approach that will include hormonal therapy. What we don't know is does that truly improve overall survival. Right. What our data has shown is it improves cause-specific uh, survival, but it doesn't impact overall survival. One of the questions patients often ask is, well, what happens if it comes back? Yeah. What, what do we do? Well, I think that that's a, a very good question. And what we do know is that there are local recurrences following prostatectomy, following brachytherapy, following all these procedures. But with high quality brachytherapy, the chances it recurs within the glands probably only about 1%. And if the patient is a candidate, those patients can have salvage radical prostatectomies. One of the half-truths that is often told to patients is that once you do this, you can't do anything else locally, and that's not true. There aren't a lot of urologists who are skilled to do the procedure just because it doesn't happen very often, but the Memorial Group and multiple other groups have done this procedure as a salvage prostatectomy with, with small amounts of morbidity and fairly good results. Are you just as confused as I am when you review the literature? with the information and the statistics? Well, you know, as you know, it's very difficult because there's so many differing definitions. There's so many different ways to slice the pie. But what I think is becoming increasingly clear is that brachytherapy has cure rates at least as good, if not better, than any of the competing modalities. For low-risk prostate cancer, they're all equivalent. Right. For intermediate and high-risk, brachytherapy has better long-term cure rates than we see with radical prostatectomy, and it's an extremely important for patients to understand that. Right.